Thank you so much, Emeka. It's wonderful to be here. As Emeka said, a couple of years ago, I did a documentary called Africa Open for Business. This was really just a documentary of 10 case studies of entrepreneurship. It really shouldn't have been a big deal at all. All of a sudden, the Cannes Film Festival was calling me. The World Economic Forum, Kofi Annan wrote me. Why? Because I showed entrepreneurship in the one place that nobody thought there was entrepreneurship. Africa is so incredibly ripe for entrepreneurship. I started this film project because I was frustrated as a journalist. I had covered Africa's wars and famines, but when I would call my editor and say, you cannot believe what is happening with cell phones right now in Africa. It is changing the face of the entire continent. They would say, oh, yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, can you go and like, follow those refugees somewhere? I wanted to show the untold story. As a journalist, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I wanted to tell the story that wasn't being told. Africa's entrepreneurs are extraordinary. I think there is something in the culture that really brings this out in people. I always say that if you give an American a plank of wood and a nail and say, put this in, the American says, okay, well, where's a hammer? Oh, I don't have one. Sorry, can't be done. You say that to an African, they say, well, let's see, I got a brick over here, I got a rock, I got my shoe, I'll do it. You bring that into the business arena and something incredible is going to happen. And that is what I saw time and time again when I was doing my film. Uh, I don't actually have the clicker to be able to do this, so maybe you can go ahead. Um, but if we can show the first film clip, this is from Africa Open for Business, and this is from Lego, so one of the children's clothing. Oh, Rough and Tumble started out in 1996. I went to Italy and I sat in Benetton and I said, this is what I want to do in Nigeria. The response was incredible. People actually wanting the Made in Nigeria garments. It was like, where's the label? I want the label outside. I want everybody to know I'm wearing Rough and Tumble. And I couldn't believe it. We don't export now. If 40% of the 120 million people in Nigeria is children, I have the potential of a huge market here. There's so much goodness in Nigeria. The possibilities of Nigeria, they are so immense, and we are so dynamic as a people. Thank you. The next one that I want to show, you know, it's easy to say that there's business in the nice places, Ghana, Botswana, all of that. But I wanted to show that the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well everywhere in Africa. And so I picked the worst of the worst, Somalia. Somalia has not had a government for more than a decade. When the government fell and the airline stopped running, one man thought, business opportunity. So here is his story. <laughs> We started in 1991 after the collapse of Somali government, after the war started in Somalia and the people were in need for air transportation. That's when we started Dalo Airlines. There's no central government to maintain the airports. We build the airports. We serve the airports. Well, sometimes it's difficult without having a government, and sometimes it is a place not to have a government. Corruption is not a problem. Corruption is not a problem because there's no government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there's no government, yeah. Somalia is a home, so we have to stay there. And we are staying for long term. <laughs> Oled, was <laughs> Oled was recently at a conference in Africa, and as everyone was complaining about their governments, he finally got up and said, why don't you just take the Somali method? Get rid of your governments. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then the next one is somebody who actually will be speaking to you tomorrow, Alieu Conte. He is one of my greatest heroes. He started what is now one of the largest cell phone companies in Africa, which by definition means probably one of the largest in the world, because Africa is one of the, the greatest growth areas in this industry. And here is his story. Hello. Hello, Sherry. The phone changed life. Oh. Our goal is to make phone affordable for the need of the population. The week that we launch, we have 35,000 people. At two years of operation, we have about 850,000 subscribers. When we launched in Kananga, one of the old ladies took the phone. 
that's my son, but where are you? <laughs> we built this tower during the war in uh, Congo. Uh, at that time, the fighting was close to Kinshasa here. This tower here was built by the locals, and when this tower was done, we were protected by the population. Alieu's company, he told me he started with $1.5 million as an investment. Five years later, it is valued at more than $1.5 billion. That means if five years ago I had put $1,000 into his company, I would be a millionaire today. Alieu, can we go back five years from now? <laughs> uh, Africa offers the highest return on direct investment in the world, and yet it receives the least amount of direct investment in the world. That doesn't make sense. Money goes where money makes money. So why isn't money going into Africa? Now, if you ask investors, they'll most often say it's because of risk. I don't believe it. If you look at a case like Botswana, Botswana has a higher sovereign credit rating than Japan. Transparency International lists it as one of the least corrupt countries on Earth. They have never had a coup or any instability. Why isn't money flooding into Botswana? They are having as hard of a time as anybody. It is because our perception of risk and the perception of risk in Africa far outdistances the real risk. I am an American. I grew up, like most Americans, being told, eat everything on your plate, there are starving children in Africa. They also used to tell us that there were starving children in China and in India. Look what happened. I was in India last year, and someone told me that the joke in India right now is that Indians, uh, that Indians tell is that American parents now say, better finish up all your homework. There's an Indian waiting to take your job. <laughs> we are taught this world order. We are the wealthy nation, and we must give to those poor, helpless Africans. The problem with this vision of a world order is it closes our minds to what is really happening, and that's that Africans are able to take care of their own affairs. This iconic image of the starving African child with the distended belly and the flies on the face, it's done so much to, in, uh, to bring money into the NGO's coffers. I don't think it's done very much for Africa. In fact, I think in many ways, it is killing the best chance that Africa has for development. Because our world order, our belief in this world order, <laughs> our belief in this world order is blinding us to the dirty little secret. And that is that aid has never, ever developed a nation. It is trade and investment. Thank you. That is how China did it, that is how India did it, and that is how Africa is doing it today. I want to show you a page from a website that I love. What most people are saying about Africa, charity, debt relief, money, what Africans are saying they need, trade, jobs, investment. This is from the website Afford, Africans for Development in London. Africans know exactly what they need. Africans are no different than anybody else. They want a better life for their children. If they have money in their pockets, they will build schools, they will build clinics, they will build a better future for themselves. You say that if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. Well, what I think is more important is if you open up a fish processing plant, then the whole village is going to eat, the whole village is going to be clothed, the whole village's children are going to go to school. That's what trade and development can do. When I started in this whole venture with the film, I didn't think that Africans would really be interested in it. I thought, you know, come on, Africans can walk outside of their door and they'll see a new Africa. Why do they need some foreigner to come and tell them what is Africa? The truth is that Africans have been really moved by the film, and I've come to understand why. If half of Africa lives on $2 or less a day, and that is a terrible figure, that is true, but by definition, the other half does not. If we truly have an unbiased media that is telling us a balanced story about Africa, then half of our stories would be about that other half of Africa that is not living on $2 a day. Where are those stories? I never see those kinds of stories. What I've come to realize is the media is like a mirror. When I look in the mirror at American television, between news and sitcoms and documentaries, whatever, I see something that is somewhat reflective of my life as an American. 
When an African looks in the mirror of the media, they don't see themselves. They see a caricature. They see a one-dimensional portrait of what is Africa. Now, for years, I had heard Africans laugh about this. You know, oh, you Americans always asking us, do we ever wear shoes? Do we grow up with monkeys in our house? Do we grow up in trees? What I never heard was the tremendous pain of this. And when my film came out, I started getting hundreds of emails from people talking about the pain that they felt from the way that the media had portrayed them. And I want to show you just three quotes from people who had written to me. These emails were just heartbreaking to realize what we're doing to Africa by the constant barrage of media images. And I think that it's important to remember that during colonialism, one of the objectives of the colonial powers was to make sure that the colonies could never compete economically. Doesn't the media, the negative media image, make sure of that too? The last one is the one that really gets to me. Here in Ireland, you would almost want to walk the streets with your face covered because of the way that we are portrayed. We really have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to Africa with this media image? We talk about Africa in the media as though Africa has no economic life. But it's even worse than that. In the Western media, Ask yourselves, when was the last time you saw a film that was a love story in Africa, of Africans? When was the last time you saw a buddy flick? When was the last time you saw a chick flick? I'll bet never. We talk about Africa as though it is just one dimension, wars, famines, or wildlife. The Ugandan ambassador in Washington is always saying to me, since I do a lot of reports for CNN, how come you guys never show Kampala in the weather? So we treat Africa as though it has no economic life, no love life, no family life, no civic life, and no weather. <laughs> a lot of you coming in today, you came in, or, or yesterday, if you flew in during the day, you got the magnificent sight of flying over Kilimanjaro. The uh, snow cap on the crater, it's beautiful. During the 1800s, the Royal Society, the Royal Geographic Society in London, refused to take the word of any African that this was actually snow. Africans knew there was snow. They might not have called it snow, but they knew that it was wet, they knew that it was white, and they knew that it was cold. But no, the Royal Geographic Society wasn't going to believe them until an English gentleman would tell them. That's kind of what we do in the media today. If a journalist goes into a refugee camp, they see Africans on the ground who are delivering aid to other Africans. It is Africans who are responsible for getting that aid out. Who do they go to interview? What I like to call the foreign savior. As somebody recently wrote, uh, according to the, the Western news media, if Africans are in bad situations like wars or famines, they can just twiddle their thumbs and rest assured that Whitey will soon come to save them. That's kind of what we do in the media. We should be letting Africans tell their own story. And the really scary part about having this uh, thing of the foreign savior is behind them are sort of the masses of the Africans. Now, Stalin had said that one death is a tragedy. A million, nothing more than a statistic. When you show Africans as the masses, when we don't hear their voices, when we don't light them properly, and so you don't see the play of emotion over their faces, when we don't hear their voices, when we don't name them, or when we do name them, we don't even pronounce their names correctly, we talk about them as the masses. And then when something happens, like Rwanda, you say, oh, what a pity. And when Darfur happens, oh, such a shame, I really must write to my congressman. But you don't really feel it, because again, it's just a, a statistic. You know, while we are ignoring what is happening in Africa, in the West, somebody else is not, China. I just came back from Shanghai at the African Development Bank meetings. And again, listen to that, the African Development Bank annual meetings that are always held in Africa they were in Shanghai. The whole week, all I could think about was, there is this incredible love affair going on between the Chinese and the Africans. China is investing unbelievable sums of money into Africa. It is on the level of the Marshall Plan. American and European businesses have got to wake up to see this, because right now, China is in there. The great thing for Africa, though, is that for the first time ever, Africa has choices. When they're getting a raw deal from somebody else, they can say, no, thank you. Actually, I've got a better deal over here. And that's a great thing for China. 
Now, I'd like to uh, play you a short clip of my next film. This is a film that's actually going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. It's called Africa Investment Horizons. My last film, I felt like it was really, you know, I was thrilled with what happened with it. But I felt like the real challenge was reaching outside of the choir. How do you get the people who never think about Africa, the people who could care less, who never would have signed up for a TED conference like this, how do you get them interested in Africa? And I think maybe the way you do it is you go after their own self-interest. Sort of a message of, oh, forget about all those problems of Africa, but stock markets are doing incredibly well, some of the highest returns in the world. Are you a savvy enough investor to be in? So that is uh, sort of the goal of the next film. This is a short clip of it, Africa Investment Horizon. They offer the highest return on direct investment in the world, have the fastest growing stock markets, some of the world's most rapidly growing economies, and all exports rivaling the Middle East. Most people would never guess that all of this is in Africa. I hardly have any, any money in the US or European market. Uh, most of my uh, earnings, money, investments are in Ghana and other African countries. We've had about four or five bull markets in which we've exceeded 100% uh, return. We're seeing more and more private equity firms creating Africa dedicated funds. We are seeing, for the first time, Africa dedicated hedge funds emerging, fairly new. But that's certainly a bellwether sign that Africa is being taken seriously from international markets. They have a better return than uh, investing in the S&P 500. And that's over a more than 10 year period. On average, they've outperformed every market in the world. It's given the kinds of returns that people uh, dream about. We don't expect to be Wall Street overnight. We don't expect to be the city of London overnight. But we should be able to compete with the likes of Malaysia and Ireland. You have to have good business sense. I mean, you have to really focus on you know the, the finances, the valuations, uh, just as you would do in any, making any kind of investment. You don't just walk into Africa and think it's, it's going to be the same as Minnesota. It's not going to happen. Africa is Africa. And you're either up on what you're about to, to run into, or you're going to sort of be a bit lost. All in all, there's money to be made here. It's real and the returns are real. Are there any more business office? Thank you. Before leaving you today, I'd like to leave you with two questions. The first is, how would we live our lives if development in Africa really mattered to us. 300 million Africans live on a dollar or less a day, and yet the average European cow, thanks to European subsidies, lives on $2 a day. How would we negotiate our trade agreements if development really mattered to us? How would we change our lives if development really mattered to us? The other question that I want to leave you with, that I hope you'll think about during this whole four days, is what can you learn from Africa? And by that, I don't mean what can you learn about Africa as far as them taking charge of their own programs and then feeding it back to them. I mean, what in your life don't you know that Africans could teach you? When I was filming Africa Open for Business, I learned about corporate social responsibility from the heart in a way that wasn't concerned about the shareholder, that wasn't concerned about being listed as the best place to work, but was really from the heart. It was about the extended family of Africa being brought into the business arena, and it was extraordinary. Those are the kinds of lessons that I think, if we stop talking and start listening to Africa, we might start learning things from Africa, instead of always thinking we can tell Africa something about themselves. So with that, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.